This is the second of three events in our celebration of the chapbook co-sponsored by the Queens College Library and the CUNY Affiliation Group for Creative Writing. That includes Brooklyn, City, Hunter, and Queens Colleges. It is supported in part by the CUNY, CUNY Office of Academic Affairs. And we have been planning this for over a year, having been postponed, having had our in-person festival postponed from last year. We had a terrific keynote and opening in February. So I am delighted to continue with this second event. Before introducing uh, our panel uh, coordinator, facilitator, I would like to um, thank a few individuals. First, Kristen Hart, Chief Librarian. I haven't figured out how to turn that off yet. Sorry, folks. Kristen Hart, Chief Librarian at Rosenthal Library. Uh, I almost said here at Queens College, but of course I'm not on campus. Leila Walker, Digital Scholarship Librarian, Tina Tam, Library Administrative Coordinator, and John Rice, the Affiliation Group Administrator, and uh, all of CUNY. We have an unusual program beginning with a panel organized and facilitated by Jenna Hamed from the Center for Book Arts in New York City. Uh, the Center for Book Arts is an organization that promotes active explorations of artistic practices related to the book as an art object. For nearly 50 years, uh, Center for Book Arts has supported artists and uplifted the book arts by presenting exhibitions, lectures, readings, and performances, also providing opportunities for artists, writers, curators, and scholars through residencies, fellowships, publishing, and collecting, and empowering the creation of new book art by providing course courses on book art-related technique and history. Um, at some point, I will put a link to their organization uh, in the chat. So please check them out. They are marvelous. I have taken classes there and gone to readings and purchased many things there uh, myself. So I'm uh, a big enthusiast also of Center for Book Arts. Jenna Hammett is an art worker, writer, and photographer based in Queens. She obtained a bachelor's degree in apparel, textiles, and merchandising from Eastern Michigan University, and a master's degree in arts politics from New York University's Tisch School of the Arts. She is currently programs manager at the Center for Book Arts, where she regularly collaborates with artists, poets, curators, and researchers on developing experimental creation and narration of the book as an art object. I couldn't imagine a more fascinating and captivating group. So please help me welcome Jenna, who will now introduce her cohort. Hello, everyone. My name is Jenna Hamid, and I'm really excited to be with all of you. I see we have people from all over the world. Um, I just want to say how humbling it is uh, to be here with you all in this digital space. Um, so uh, I am so excited to have our three panelists today. Um, and I'm gonna do a pretty uh, extensive introduction to their work before they dive into the conversation. So I'm gonna share my screen. I have a, a presentation. Um, and of uh, a rumination on chat books. And then I'm also gonna introduce the work of each, um, of each poet or each artist as well. Um, 
I'd also like to thank the uh, folks at Queens College and CUNY who made the chat book content, the chat book festival possible. Sorry, we have a chat book contest, so it's ingrained in my brain to say that. Um, and I also want to say that everything that I'm showing you are books that exist in real life. Um, I highly recommend that you support these artists and other book artists as well, um, since seeing the books through the screen is not the same as experiencing them in your hands. So with that, I want to pose a very important question of what is a chat book? To answer, to answer the question of what a chat book is, we must first approach the question of what constitutes a book to which you'd have a more productive time answering what a book isn't. While I'd love to dive into the contentious debate of what constitutes a book, theorizing and deconstructing our preconceived notions with everyone here today, all of you literary people, bibliophiles, bookmakers, and academics, we don't nearly have enough time to delve into this discussion during this particular event. So instead, I wanna invite you to visit Center for Book Arts where we explore the book as a contemporary and historical art object through classes, exhibitions, artist residencies, public education programs, studio practice, and more. We also have a fine art collection, an archive, and a research library of books about books, of which I'll be presenting a few of them in the coming slides. So I've been a part of the Center's community for about two and a half years now, and have since come to imagine the book arts as if the book arts field as a conceptual playground for discussions within and surrounding form, structure, process, and functionality intersected with design and the visual arts. Book arts embraces the expansiveness of what we call a book and what we call art. The book is art, art makes the book. I've also come to learn that book arts is a vehicle for community building. As any bookmaker will tell you, it takes a village to make a book. As we go through today's presentation and conversation, you'll notice a list of acknowledgements for each book. The journey of the book departs from multiple starting points initiated by a team of thinkers traveling through many channels of possibility. What can be most exciting is the fact that the book doesn't end with the finished object. The lifespan of the book can exist in, undef in undefined realms of infinity as the book is experienced, performed, and activated across time and place by a long lineage of audiences. Now, back to the definition of a book. For the sake of this conversation, let's define the book as simply a container of text and image, often described as a time-based sequential finite object. From, the, from even the most simplest of definitions, the concept of the book already has the capacity to exist in an ever-evolving manner. Seeing what constitutes a book operates more as a spectrum than a binarism, then how then can we think of the poetry chapbook? A poetry chapbook can be defined as a limited edition booklet of poems with a less amount of pages than a typical trade poetry book would contain. In the contemporary book arts lens, chapbooks depart from this tradition. While books can be considered containers of text and image and chapbooks are traditionally bound and soft cover, the book art serves as a framework in which one can reconsider the format and materiality in which the book is produced, emphasizing the intertwining of poetic narrative with compositional structure of the book and the way in which the poem lives on the page. The book becomes a touch point for capturing the migration of intersecting ideas of visuality, textuality, and functionality. Poetry chapbooks in the book arts create a grounding for the essential integration between process and collaboration, starting with the conversation between book artist and poet. This conversation is initiated and led by the poetry manuscript, 
situating the intention and direction of the chapbook design, steering the ways the poem will be sequenced, formatted, found, presented, and even archived. When commissioning a chapbook contest, I share the poems with the book artist along with the project proposal to give time for the poetry to resonate with the artist. And it is then that a decision can be made as to whether this is a body of work the artists want to live inside of for the time it'll take to produce the entire edition of books. The artist takes into account the budget and materials presented as well, because what is a book without limitation? Today we'll hear from three book artists who are part of Center for Book Arts community, Aurora de Armendi, Farid de Marab, and Erica Morillo, each of whom carry specificity in their practice when it comes to methods of bookmaking. I'll start with a short presentation of their work, and they will then convene for a 30 minute conversation about their process and collaboration with designing poetry chapbooks. First, I will start with Farid Mareb. Farid Mareb is an award-winning book designer, researcher, and editor from Venezuela, currently residing in New York City. She is the founder of Ediciones Letra Muerta, a publishing press that focuses on reproducing archival matter established in 2014. On this project, Farid collaborated with David Puig of Ediciones de Apoco on publishing a series of translated poems. This particular publisher is dedicated to translating Arabic and English language poems into Spanish. Here, Mareb takes a series of four chapbooks and generates a visual theme of linearity on the cover design. Each of the saddle stitch vellum cover jackets wrap around the book, marked with different color variations and numbers that correlate with the series edition signifying the collectivity and the cohesion of the groupings of books. With the interior of the book, Mareb incorporates facsimiles or photo scans of the original poetry book pages, contextualizing the original object and the original container, placing it adjacent to the typeset Spanish text. There is a clear distinction between the English and Spanish, the font variation the trans between the translated texts and the recto and verso, verso or the right and left side of the spread. Here, there is a it is prevalent that the design of the page carries the integrity of and is inspired by the archived object. In one of Merab's most, free, most recent works, French unpublished poems and facsimiles from 1958 to 69 by Mio Vesterini, translated by Patrick Durgan, you can see that Faride sections, sections the book into three parts, marked by the paper type and size. In the larger pamphlet, Merab takes on the facsimile once again to incorporate the archival materials of the author. On the green pages, which are smaller in size, the poems are typeset with translations using vari varying fonts. In this chapbook, Mareb plays with the structure, material, and format of the book, layering with textures and tactile qualities that give each chapbook a handmade touch. <clears throat> the archival matter of her book often serves to reappropriate and recontextualize, breathing in new life into the historical object, referencing and reminiscing on an enriching past while informing the futurity of the work. In her project with the Washington Project for the Arts, Mareb was commissioned to create an edition of Venezuelan passport facsimiles in conjunction with the exhibition Notions of Exile, which she co-curated co with Fabiola R. Delgado. She produced 300 mock passports that were mailed out to participants across the country and across the world. The project invites recipients to activate the work by asserting their own identity-based narratives inside of the book.
Next, I'd like to introduce the work of Erica Morillo. Erica Morillo is a New York-based artist and educator born and raised in the Dominican Republic. Her primary practice as a photographer is informed by her studies in psychology and sociology as a way of understanding her own lineage, her family, her family's histories, and her surrounding environments. Morillo has produced a number of photo book projects centering the narrative around the subject in site specificity, site specific subjectivity. Between her photo spreads can be found texts that mimic the composition of the image, reorienting the reader's handle of the book, adding a breath between the image works. Text is a source of imagery for Murillo's works. Playing off the photographic works, contrasting the subject matter, creating abstractions and representations that decontextualize and recontextualize the narrative of the image sequence. Erica also cites archival images to contribute a new trajectory to the archival matter, intervening and rebuilding a scaffolding of historical narrative. In 2020, Center for Book Arts commissioned Erica to produce a chapbook for our annual poetry chapbook competition, judged by Raquel Salas Rivera. Caterina Ramos Jordan was the winner of the competition. In this chapbook, Murillo initiates a conversation with the poet by asserting her photographic images in commissioned digital illustrations alongside the poetic works, which are bound and assembled as a dos a dos structure, creating a wraparound effect of the cover. Erika created 100 copies of this book with each cover made of cyanotypes using sun printing techniques, making each cover unique to the weather conditions it was produced under. The illustrations are extracted from iconographies throughout the poetry manuscripts, such as the man mangrove. Murillo situates an image in our mind with the illustrations by Karina Ale I Aleiga and Javier Olguin. The text was letterpress printed by Matt Collins using a blue ink to match the cyanotype covers. Lastly, I'd like to discuss the work of Aurora de Armendi. Aurora de Armendi is an interdisciplinary artist. She works primarily in printmaking, video, and artist books. She uses research and experimentation to explore themes of identity and place. Aurora integrates her exploratory findings through the physical qualities of the book, such as color saturation and the tactility of the page, creating her specific trajectory in the book arts tradition. With Aurora's work, Grappling with the narrative of the literary text is an essential jumping off point to her process. Sorry, my presentation froze. Often working in literary translation, she runs the text through, often working in literary translation, she runs the text through yet another form of translation through analog typesetting, which demands the intention and attention to the way in which each letter is situated on the page, making the page itself an image, occupied with negative space, carefully typeset words, and minimalistic illustrations evoking new interpretive visual syntax to the poem. In Libro de las Preguntas, or A Book of Questions, Aurora calls attention to the Haitian and Cuban refugees detained in Guantanamo Bay under supervision of the American military. A Book of Questions is composed of queries directed toward the Haitian 
and Cuban detainees and Guantanamo Bay employees, including soldiers, physicians, and social workers whose paths all intersected during a specific moment in the prison's history. This book is a gesture of memory and reconciliation as an effort to remember together. The questions were written in Spanish by Aurora de Armendi and translated into Haitian Creole and English. While much of Armendi's work is situated in the textual form, in this accordion structure, she uses design, dye, and binding to narrativize the prints of Jennifer Nagel Myers. This structure allows the audience to break the time-space sequence of the traditional book to see an entire scope of work at once when the accordion is activated. While still given the opportunity to spend time with each individual spread, which are punctuated with the empty pages of the verso or the left side of the spread. Read Bed Ash and Other Products is written by Center for Book Arts 2020 Chapbook Contest judge Raquel Salas Rivera with the design direction by Armendi and production support from Ana Paula Cordero. The manuscript is a translation of two poems containing abstracted line drawings across the cover and among the text pages. Armendi uses complementary colors as a demonstration of the synthesis of the number two, which reoccurs in her choice to construct the book as a dos a dos structure, which opens from two sides, containing two poems translated in two languages. Armendi describes her illustrations as broken to match the syntax line breaks of Rivera's poems. When flipping through the book, the line drawings can be traced across the landscape of the handmade cover paper and the text pages as well. The illustration can be viewed on the back side of each page, creating a conversation between the text and image and the composition of the page. Armendi attributes the space of the page to be an important aspect of this work. As a reader, the space may read as silence, pacing, rhythm, a moment to shift when engaging with Rivera's poems. So now I'd like to welcome our panelists to the Zoom stage. Um, I'm gonna spotlight. Okay, so yeah, we're all here. I spent a really long time looking at your works and, and just like thinking about them in reference to the conversation that we had last month with our pre-panel discussion and also being familiar with your work um, since being at Center for Book Arts. So it was really great. And yeah, I hope that um, I hope that I captured some elements of, of your practice there. So with that, um, I want to pose the first question for you all, which is, how did your relationship with the book arts emerge? We can take a stab at it. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. My name is Erika Murillo. I'm so excited to be in conversation with people, although virtually, but it feels wonderful during these very strange times. Um, it's very interesting when we were talking about this presentation, you know, three different women making uh, books and from different contexts, but all in Latin America, you know, Aurora from Cuba and Faride from Venezuela, and I'm from Dominican Republic. So I think each country has 
its own context that uh, sort of initiated us in the book arts. But I think for me, my initial uh, interest in it was as a way of deepening the conversation that was happening in my home and around my family. So I come from a family where everything is like, you know, they like to keep things light, you know, this uh, sort of like Caribbean way of, of um, sometimes staying in the surface. Um, and I felt I always yearned to have a deeper conversation uh, when I was at home or when I was with family and it just didn't happen. And I felt that's how I started to write. And also I remember as a kid, just putting together and stapling a small book and handing it out, you know, as this way of continuing the conversation. So I think in my case, it came from a desire to deepen what was being talked about around me. And also I kind of found, uh, I was also interested in imagery and photographs, and I found an absence of that that was coming from women in my country. Um, right now, um, you know, since I'm a photographer and uh, I'm very interested in the photographic image, you know, this uh, concept of photo books or image and text was like largely absent from Dominican uh, publishing. There were small houses doing uh, this, uh, but it's just like getting started. So that's kind of uh, another reason why I got into it to kind of, um, yeah. I guess. Fadi, are you answering that or? <laughs> so my uh, my relationship with the I want to well I want to say thank you Jenna for introducing our work in that way and thank you CUNY for this opportunity as well um, and Kimiko. Um, I my my relationship with the book began actually in the United States in a more serious way. Um, I think uh, growing up in Cuba, we, uh, especially in the period of the 80s and the 90s, um, uh, what we call the special period in Cuba, there was very little resources. I, um, I, I remember, uh, I mean, as a, as a young adult, really loving working with paper and collage as a, as a, as a, as a young adult. But uh, really realizing the the book and the potential for the book as a uh, as a physical object that happened um, later in my life when I took pre making courses when I took letter press when I learned um, paper making with Cara Di Eduardo at Cooper Union uh, where I um, I went to school and all of these processes together and um, the interaction of, of all of these processes and histories together, material histories, really uh, made me interested in the book as, a, as an object because of its portability, you know, the fact that we can um, um, take it with us, it's an intimate space, it's, a, it's an object that have a life beyond ourselves when we make it, and um, and yes, that's, I think that that's how my relationship with the book began. It began here in the United States, not in, in Cuba. Um, yeah. Oh, so I guess it's my turn. <laughs> um, well, I'm a neurodiverse person. And as a child, I had a really hard time um, I guess, have, building relationships with other people. So I ended up becoming the, a librarian's assistant at school. And I ended up figuring out a lot of things about books. And I think that books became up the way that I related to people, you know, through reading, through, through making, through writing. And as I grew older, I think I, I tried to incorporate everything book related with what I was doing because I see bookmaking and publishing as an artistic practice. And um, in that sense, um, 
I guess in, in contrast with what Erica said and what Aurora said, Erica said she was seeing, you know, a, a void by women making things in her country and Aurora with the situation in Cuba started making books here. To me, since I migrated, it has been a, a fact of keeping the, tradi the tradition, the Venezuelan tradition in bookmaking. So it's kind of like a way of um, keeping myself real and um, making sure I'm being loyal to who I am. Venezuela has a very big, big uh, publishing and book arts tradition and not only in the country, but internationally. And I think having learned with a master printer, I think I carry like this responsibility of, <laughs> of keep that, uh, I guess that, um, um, esa herencia, esa, um, that heritage, is that how you say in English? That heritage and in a way to keep myself focused and, you know, um, so my, actually my, what I do for a living is designing books and that's, and my artistic practice goes in parallel. I think I put the same energy to what I do for a living to my artistic practice. So it's hard to draw lines in between, I guess. I find that interesting. I just want to add something to what you said, Faride, about how um, me coming from Dominican Republic and finding that, you know, there weren't like photo books or, you know, materials to draw inspiration from, but you coming from Venezuela, which has like a rich tradition in bookmaking and publishing and thinking how that was influenced by the European migration that you guys had, you know, how with uh, the influx of migration can also come this um, amazing uh, hybrid nature in the sign and influences, which I think in the Caribbean looks very different than what it looks like in Venezuela. So I always find that fascinating how you know, well, you know, uh, almost everything that has to do with polishing in Venezuela goes in hand with oil, <laughs> fortunately or unfortunately. And in the 50s, there was a huge uh, European migration to Venezuela that besides us being colonized by the Spaniards, you know, in the beginning. Um, we had, I would say, a mix, a mix of aesthetics that incorporated some of the modernism that was occurring, you know, in places like um, specifically, I, I would put the example of Gert Leufer, uh, Nedo Mionferrer, and La Rijun, um, that came from Lithuania, Italy, and the United States, etc. So that huge migration and that aesthetic that was happening, uh, along with a lot of Argentinian designers, I think defined a new era of design. Also the creation of many design schools uh, that were very influenced by, um, by what was happening in the country at Escuela Cristóbal Rojas. I would say was kind of like the beginning of Venezuelan design, a very vernacular aesthetic that incorporated very pictoric um, um, compositions People like Cruz Diaz, for example, who is actually having a, a show right now at Museo de Reina Sofia. So I think the hybrid, it's the representation of bookmaking in Venezuela has a very hybrid nature. And mm -hmm. I think it's also like, it, it's a parallel, parallel with the political situation, you know, oil, migration, um, political exiles from, you know, all these parts of the world and yeah, and also there weren't many women making books or doing design. And when I used to study, my first career is design before I studied art. And um, almost every woman was studying uh, fashion or interior design. And the ones who were studying graphic were kind of like weirdos back in the day. And the ones who were inside of graphic that went with typography or books were kind of like <laughs> even worse and I was one of those so I'm here like yeah that's me 
I want to add a little bit of what um, Fadi that you were saying. I mean, Cuba has a very um, a long tradition of literary publishing, you know, like Revista Orígenes, all of this publishing that, you know, was happening before the Castro regime. Um, and I, it's just interesting for me that the book arts career for me began here, but then as an adult, I look back at the production that is happening in Cuba. And even in the 90s, with very little resources, they were publishing places like Ediciones Vigia, you know, cre creating things with very limited um, paper and, you know, writing all the poetry by hand and all of that. So. Yeah, I think the, the technological lacking or limitations that we had in countries like ours nurtured the aesthetic and even impulse the results of what we were making. In the case of Venezuela, we were, I think, uh, the last ones in South America to receive, you know, to get the printing press. Uh, Me Mexico was the first place to get the printing press, even before the US. But in our case, I think the last place was Uruguay and then Venezuela. So everything we had was imported. All the books we had were coming from Spain and from other places. So I guess when it was our turn to receive the press, we were kind of eager <laughs> to make things happen. So we, a lot of interesting things occurred um, from mentioning the miniatures of um, Julio, Febres, Julio Febres Cordero or even the imagotipias that were happening with mobile type, uh, even before we saw things like linotype in the US and stuff like that. So I think uh, the technical limitations just you know, open more doors for us mentally. And I think that's also what differentiates um, us as artists, you know, the resourcefulness that we have with so little, <laughs> with, <laughs> with having so little and yep. Can you, um, can you all talk about why you chose to engage with the book format with all of your, the projects that you've done so far and specifically with poetry projects? Um, and this can be, you know, about any aspect of the chat book and, and the book itself. I felt very compelled to, um, I started to be interested in including writing or poetry uh, alongside imagery. And uh, because I felt as in my practice as a photographer, when I was trying to make a book, I always wanted to speak further about the image or write poetry about the image. And then in the photo book tradition, there's this purist approach of like, you know, the photograph should speak by itself, you know, you shouldn't, you know, the photograph, the photographic image should be enough. And I just think that is a very traditional approach that limits the kind of experimentation that you can have by placing image and text together. And I think the chat book is a great space where photography can be in conversation um, with um, poetry and uh, in the, for example, in the chapbook that I did for Caterina, you know, I didn't want to include just like a photograph. I wanted to include a photographic process. That's why I chose cyanotype because she was uh, talking about the mangrove and she was also talking about Caribbean identity and a, a lot of her poems alluded to salt water and also the sea and the blue sky. So I felt that cyanotype with its like, um, chemical reaction and, and with the harsh sun that makes the image, just like there were these parallels when talking about the Caribbean or when, you know, reading her poetry. And I just find that um, chat books are a great playground for image and text, which is kind of what I try to do in my work to have the book be a space where image and text can you know, allude to the form, but also to the content of uh, what you're presenting. Also, what I like about chat books, and I think it's really fascinating right now in Latin America and also inspired by all the cartonera publishing and, you know, these kind of like publishing initiatives with what you have at hand that kind of uh, 
uh, punk ethos of zine making and like the risograph. Like there are really interesting projects happening in the Caribbean, like in Puerto Rico right now, there's La Impresora doing amazing work and um, Ediciones de a Poco, which is also utilizing risograph. And um, I find that chat books allow you more than when you're making a traditional photo book to kind of utilize the materials you have at hand and to experiment a bit more without necessarily um, ruining the image or altering the photographic image, which in the photo book can, in the photo book can be a little bit complicated because you know uh, how archival is the image, you know uh, how faithful are you to the original image. So that's um, kind of what I like in working in the chat book form. Um, the chat book, I mean, we're surrounded by print, um, is all around us, right? In a digital space, in, in, in social media, but a chat book is, um, is such an intimate space for a reader to, um, to, you know, to engage with poetry, to engage with the work of a writer, um, and then in, in at the same time, us as artists, when we're working in the chapel, paying attention to how the, the the poems inspire the process and inspire the materials, we're giving um, the poet and and the writing, you know, the space that it deserves. I think it's like kind of a slowing down and and being you know present with with the work. Um, I have always been inspired by writings and poetry and literature, and um, and I think um, the giving form when I'm, you know, for example, with Raquel Salas Rivera's uh, poem, it was so inspiring to me reading her work and and the imagery that that came to my mind and also. Uh, my desire to express through materials like the texture of paper, the color of, of, the, of, of the cover, the drawings, you know, how can I can, can enhance um, uh, her work or they work, ex uh, excuse me. Um, yeah. yeah. I think in my case, it has to do with two things. The first thing is being in service of the poet uh, sometimes I find that the majority of people who approach me to talk or discuss or the possibility of creating a chat book are people who have um, a draft of a possible poetry book or they, they're still working on the poems and they don't want to do like a full print run or the selection of poems will be of 60 and they only have like 30 so far but they want to you know, have that circulating. And I think the same thing happens uh, with academic essays. If you have an abstract and you wanna hand it to colleagues. So I think chapbook is the perfect form for that. I would say a chapbook is like a, like a booklet or a plaquette that rebranded. <laughs> it's um, endless, endless possibilities for, uh, for different genres, not only poetry. And I think I would also like to see it as the beginning of a book, because if you see chat books from their original form, immediately what I think is not, um, you know, this European perspective of having this amount of pages in saddle binding, and that means that's a chat book. No, to me, it comes from the kind of like the contestatory immediate um, need to produce this kind of like the zine. Uh, ethos that Erica was talking about. So I think with a chat book, it's kind of like a way of saying, um, I want to ignore the traditional <laughs> printing, uh, uh, editing uh, um, processes, and I want to make this happen no matter what. So that's why I think it's at service of everyone, special po especially poets. And when you say the question said something about engaging the chat book as a poetry publication, in my case, it began in a very weird form. I'm not a religious person. 
And there's a quote by Hani Asad that I really like, I'm an Islam poet. She says that she wrote, I escribo poemas para hombres que no saben orar. So it translates something like, I write poetry for men who don't know how to pray. So having this tradition of the book coming from the Bible to me and being poetry and philosophy, kind of like my <laughs> religions, my way of relating, my, relating myself with the world, um, having that space uh, to create an experience and share that experience with others by making more copies. <laughs> it's very important. I want to address a question that we had in the chat uh, from David, and he's asking about image and text and how do we decide what to include in image and text um, in the book form. And I think I can answer this. This applies to chat books as well, but I can answer this more from the photo book um, tradition, and it's that I think when you're making a photo book that includes image and text, I think the concept of the book and that clarity of the concept is what's going to determine how, or at least what I think of when I am thinking of what text to include, how much text, what things to leave out. For example, when I was working in my first photo book, all of them, which had to do a lot with not remembering my father when I died, when he died, when I was very young, I started to forget him. So a lot of the texts that I included have a lot of gaps. It's not explanatory, it's not lineal. It um, honors the way that memory works with its gaps and also how with time, memory also starts to become fiction. So when I'm thinking about text, um, and including it and pairing it with photography, I'm always thinking about how that is going to service uh, the concept. Uh, for example, another example I want to bring out is uh, the work of Sora Pura, this um, Indian photographer who's making amazing photo books. And in his first photo book, um, Life is Elsewhere, he's talking about the relationship with his mother who suffers from mental illness. And there's, it's heavily laden with text, which feels very diaristic and confessional. And you feel as a reader that you're giving all his burden to carry. And I think that works very well because he's talking about mental illness. And when you go into the work, you feel burdened by it. Um, so I think um, it really depends what you're trying to convey and that's gonna determine um, how do you integrate the text, but, um, with time, I think one thing that I try to do with my work and I've been trying to refine is uh, how do I explain less and um, trust the reader to kind of fill in the gaps which, with what I don't say. And I think that's something that changes with each project and a learning process for everyone um, who's making books. How do you do this? Um, and it's also very personal. I don't think that there is a formula. I think there are books that are heavy with text and it works wonderful. And sometimes a lot of text can also be too burdensome for the reader. I have kind of like two opinions on that, piggyback writing on what Erica said. Not to be, you know, a reductionist, but to me it also has to do with the fact of tradition of how poetry was published back in the day and how chapbooks were made. You know, text and image were typeset differently. It was different plates. It was a different machine. It was a different uh, skill. So sometimes what we think we are um, imitating or keeping how it should be is just a technical limitation from back in the day. And now that we don't have those limitations most of the time, um, I say we also have more freedom to have a different approach to poetry books. In my case, uh, with Letra Muerta, I have published, I would say six poetry books because the other two are um, um, literary interview and uh, short narrative, short stories. And all of the books, absolutely all of them had photography. And this is something that Erica and I were discussing when she saw my books the first time. She was like, why do all your books have photography? And I said something that I think it's quite relevant that it's when the poems were written, there were many things that hadn't happened yet working with archival poetry. But when the time passed and the authors died, 
you get a sense of what their future was after those poems were written. So having images, handwritten notes, facsimile, even a receipt can be relevant uh, to complete the story of what you're reading. So if the poet, for example, is talking about her wish of having children or I don't know, a turbulent relationship with her mother. And then in that book, 40, 60, 80 years later, you see that at, towards the end, there's a photo of a daughter or her mother or a note or a letter. I think those elements complete the experience you know, of what happened after, uh, what is it that you're reading or even having to you know, kind of like visual clues to complete uh, literary images that the text is also evoking. So one experience I had, I was working, and I don't know why I'm mentioning Hani Asad so much today, I'm sorry, I just all the examples that come to mind are from her. Uh, maybe it's because I'm working on a chat book with her text. Um, she referred to this coat that belonged to her mother. And when I was processing her archive, I went to her, her family's house and I was documenting papers, you know, uh, these belong to this year, these are handwritten. I was kind of categorizing everything. And then her sister uh, said, well, and I also have this. And she took out of the closet the coat. And that to me was like, wow, I was mind blown because what to her seemed just like a coat to me was the, the missing clue of this poem where she talked about a coat that I didn't even know if it even existed. So to me, those, all those elements enrich and nurture uh, the experience, not only in chat books, but also you know, in books and in printed matter. Following what Erica and Fadi there are talking about the relationship between text and image, I also think sometimes when I'm making my work of, of text as image or text as texture, um, you know, for example, in the Three Taino myths, where most of the text is creating the imagery right within that white space and um, and it is interesting to think that sometimes even following the question that i see in the chat jenna right now like some uh, nev is speaking about is your self-expression at the forefront of your mind in creating it or the reader's experience um you know following that question and thinking about text and image, I'm, I'm going to give it an example with a book of questions uh, in which I was mostly interviewing a lot of uh, different refugees that were in, in Guantanamo, Cuban and Haitian refugees. A lot of them showed me photographs of their experience, their photographs that the Marines took in the camps when they were there. And you know, as as uh, as an artist working specifically in that project in the form of the book, uh, I was dealing with that challenge: Do I show these images, or are questions or language enough to talk about the experiences of these refugees? Um, and and that was it, that was an interesting time for me because it's like, how do I? I'm a visual artist, but in this case, I don't think that the image. Is, is appropriate. So I was thinking in that case, a lot about my reader and the experience of the reader interacting with the pages of the book and reading these questions to evoke a kind of imagery of, uh, of that specific place. Okay. Um... I hate to cut this conversation short, but uh, it's time to transition to the poetry reading. But before we go, I just wanted to ask um, each of you if you could summarize in one sentence what the most important aspect of the chat book is for you. What, what is integral to your practice, to your, to your process of designing and producing a chat book? I think to me, um, as I'm getting more into chapbooks, I think materiality is one thing. I mean, given that the poetry is great and that the body of work is amazing that you're working with, but how can the materials be an extension of what you're reading? How, when you're talking, let's say about a mangrove, how can 
there be tendrils in the paper? How can, you know, that be extended? So I'd say materiality as an extension of the poetry or the words. I would agree with Erica. Um, I think about that. I, well, I first read the poems, and I and I and I look at the writing, and and then I think how how as an artist I can complement this voice the way I understand it, the voice of the poet, and how the materials can evoke um, the the can engage our senses, you know. Uh, the, by by uh, thinking about the haptic qualities of the book and how touching the book and interacting with the materials can be another way of, of communicating the writing or the poems or the experience of reading this poem. Yeah. I, I wish I had something interesting to say, but I don't. <laughs> well, thank you all so much for taking part in this conversation. Uh, it's an ongoing conversation, especially as our, um, our limitations and in our conditions and environments uh, change over time. Um, and everyone can follow their works on their websites. If you Google their names, you'll find the publishers that they're affiliated with. You'll see their personal websites. Um, we also sell some of their publications on the Center for Book Arts Bookshop website. So please um, patronize the artists and also uh, support your local publishers, um, uh, independent publishers. Uh, so with that all said, thank you again. Um, please stick around for the poetry reading that is happening right now, right here, right now. Um, thanks again. Thank you very much, uh, Jenna and all the artists. Uh, what an incredible treat. Um, a pleasure to view the chapbook as both a local and as an international work. And uh, I wrote in the chat, it was a real pleasure to hear all the artists uh, refer to other artists. It just uh, really expanded the whole international network. I love that so much, so thank you. Um, please look at uh, the Center for Book Arts website um, and also take a look at uh, the CUNY chapbook website, we have on there on our bookshelf, some uh, digital chapbooks, and you can take a look at different kinds of chapbooks. Some are fairly scrappy, uh, and some are uh, real art objects that are uh, some uh, one of a kind art, art objects, in fact. So um, thank you for that uh, really inspired uh, uh, discussion and one that is a continuing discussion, especially as we move outward. Um, it is a special pleasure to host a reading by four alum from the CUNY, from the four CUNY MFA programs. Um, this reading is organized by John Rice, who is himself uh, an alum from Queens College MFA program. He is a terrific poet, he is a terrific reading coordinator, and a person on whom I depend for administrating projects. So please welcome John Rice, who will introduce the <laughs> readers. Thank you so much, Kamiko. <laughs> So lovely to see you all. Uh, I'm John Rice, and as Kamiko says, I'm going to be your MC for the reading portion of uh, today's festivities. Just tighten this up, you know, get the tie. We got the good reading. Uh, so before uh, before we start up, I just want to say uh, I feel the success of this festival, and I do mean success because we have 150 people here sitting in their rooms listening to us right now. Uh, the chapbooks are not small books they loom large over our literary landscape. They, 
you know, are the perfect place for words that are self-contained within themselves, work that's too bold for conventional publication, the intersection between uh, different forms and genres of arts, uh, and quite often a bold beginning for emerging writers. Uh, so we've just heard a most excellent panel sponsored by the Center for Book Arts. Uh, the panelists were wonderful uh, about the making of chapbook manuscripts. Now uh, you're gonna hear those ideas come to life in a different way uh, in the reading of these four graduates of CUNY's MFA uh, in creative writing programs. Uh, I'm gonna introduce each reader to you before they come onto the screen. Uh, and I encourage you to applaud uh, and celebrate them in the chat uh, or however you see fit. Uh, first up is Dudrick Bevins, uh, who I'm gonna ask to unmute themselves and prepare themselves while I read their bio. Hmm. Archivist of a Fractured World, Dudrick Bevins is a queer inter inter interdisciplinary artist, sorry, from Deliver's country uh, in the North Georgia mountains. He lives and creates in New York City where he teaches literature and creative writing to high school students in Harlem. He is an MFA student at CCNY and, and holds an MA in American Studies. Uh, his writing and photography have been published in two books by BD Studios NYC, uh, Georgia Dusk and Root 4 Box 358. Uh, his chapbook, My Feelings Are Imaginary People Who Fight for My Attention, uh, is available through Poets Haven author series and his collaborative chapbooks are available from, uh, gonna just try to pronounce this, Kinsley Kinsley. Press. I do that right? Yep. Yes, awesome. Uh, please welcome Doug Rick. Thank you, John. Uh, <clears throat> so when the pandemic hit and we were all quarantined, I decided that it was time to go ahead and start my own uh, micro press. And so I did. Um, one of the first books um, that I did was a collaborative work with my friend Alan that I grew up with back in Georgia. Um, the goal of my micro press is to publish um, queer folks, people of color, uh, people who have been incarcerated or are incarcerated and um, graduate students who work in between the areas of artistic expression and academic research. So this first book with Alan was written while he was actually um, incarcerated uh, during the pandemic right at the beginning. And we used the jail mail 50 cents uh, an email system to write. So uh, this uh, very small book, um, Light Travels Further Than Sound, contains all of those poems and um, the emails. Unfortunately, he is still there and I am here, so I will only read my parts. Naked. Dressing me in winter sweats, white briefs, tiny, elastic of the waist tugs skin, then blue sweats. A race car in glitter, red that only the 80s knew, small body, a miniature, standing on the toilet, false memory of snow, his hands, course of course. I can't know the difference. We are before comparison. Time when what was, was without exception. I am there now and never there. Tying knots in reverse. We can be here and never be here again. Your brother. Second one. I am of little comfort I hurt when you hurt, swallow whole the stifled words and beg you easy tongue. Can I flatten you out, undo the undo crumple, make smooth the furrows of rippled memory, gift you panacea, oak, hemlock tea to sip into your Socrates death. My father is the food of sickness, he's young, 56 this birthday, brain damaged from radiation. I sat with you once, high, my parents asleep, dim light of kitchen sink fixture, note from my father on the table. You said, look how restrained his writing. You said, what is he holding back? 
I check my own script before I hit send. I ask the same of you. Moon, above us soon, 900 miles between us in a chain link fence and the cliche act of glue that folds space time like books, folds gravity. Your unfinished sentences become the beginnings of mine, shuttled between then and now, I carry the little boys with our names inside me. There is a green light that shines here too. Your back seeped and right up through Ginsburg's America, right through the back glass, following Whitman's walk. You, you're always my Gatsby. Meatloaf singing, parasite, uh, paradise beside. These words are a dock, you bandit. Let's make a time ship and sail the ocean closer to heaven than we imagined. Uh, so another one. Today, I am pagan, nature's fawn, as I was when we were satyrs, taught bacchanal, sitting in underwear creek, burn the whole of a tree in inches, brownie burnt on a stick, shitting kid guts of Mountain Dew over a log. Today, we celebrate Rupakelia ward off evil spirits. The postal service of my soul sends you a sage bundle, Ganesh, four raw amethysts. Have you considered our soul's touch the moment we were under that tree, your hand covering my heart, crab apples, small branches? I put your fingers there, horned God out of the forest, walk on buck legs. He, still watching, we still touching. If there is only one thing, it is this word. It is that word I cannot speak. Another. Your voice. Copper-headed echo from a Gilmer County tin can. Sometimes I think we're hobos on the Infinity Railroad car. No sun, no sunflower or sutra. I saved your letters of purloined freedom. I learned in Atlanta, walking through streets, looking for homeless youth to feed in the corners of the cities where we did not buy acid. I learned that there are still people hopping trains, kids who duck under overpasses and hide from the cops, kids who sleep in doorways and dilapidated houses. Between rides, I think, when the wind stops blowing, after the summer circada have cried, you and I high again will walk down to the Harlem River and watch the trains. We'll sit on a bench, we'll listen. Water and steel against steel, the moment of halt before momentum makes everything, including us, begin again. Next, this one and one more. King Agamemnon. I want to build you a metaphor, Icarus perhaps, fallen boys in crash chariots like Phaethon or your little red car on the side of the highway, car whose back seat I only knew once or butterflies preserved with ether puffs. In the changing room of an indoor pool, we as boy-bodied nymphs, the cave of old sirens, furies and valkyries in flight, we are brothers, sons of son and of our fathers, two birthed the same, child of a broken universe, starfish regrow limbs. I'm asking you about your scar. How old is your son? How old is our father? Does anyone remember the tailor, the medic, who hoop-stitched the heel of Achilles closed? 
I don't. Uh, and this will be the last one. And this is the last poem in the book before the, the letters begin in the appendix. The morning sighs, dew of wet dreams and gods, not hearing, but still possibly present, lighter. Just as bright, it flickers, damp asses from grass bedded stargazers and the cramp of empty gut that says both eat and don't. Mix of honeysuckle and morning glory, lemonade stirred with sweet William, taste of I ivy and half melted easy caps. That red paired with the light breaking through the lattice leafed apple tree above us, Walk home, walk home together, walk home dusty, never dry. Thank you. I'll mute myself and plug, yeah. Ooh. Fantastic, Duggar, yeah. All right, we are zooming along. We're getting into our next college. Uh, Next up to the stage is uh, Charles Theonia. Uh, Charles is a poet, teacher, and editor from Brooklyn, uh, where they're working to externalize interior femme landscapes. They are the author of the art book, Saw Parmetto's uh, Container, 2018, and the chapbook, Which One is the Bridge, Topside Press, 2015. They received an MFA in poetry from Brooklyn College. Uh, please welcome Charles. Hi everyone. I'm still thinking about those morning glories melting into lemonade. Delicious. Um, and I love the panel. Um, I feel like everyone, all poets probably want someone to pay such close, beautiful attention to the materiality of our work. So I hope we're all so lucky. Um, so I wanted to start by reading a poem from a chapbook I have really loved recently. Um, it's called Hope is Weird by Nora Treat Baby. Um, she is a trans writer in Louisiana. The press is um, called Other Weapons and it gathers work by sex workers and their accomplices. Um, so I'll just read one poem from that and then move into my chat book. Hello Earth. I have driven to the edge of who I can be. I am also a sphere and I am a woman. It's what they tell you when you tell them you are not. They tell me the architecture is for my own good, that these clean lines and high ceilings will create finer and more graceful movements in the soul that I can't be in here with all this normal air. This new government is signaling that the self is the lawman now. It's the norms that concern me. Different slants pointed at the same object. I step out to consider why my transness doesn't feel like a bird at all. The norms change around me as I change. Is this proof there is no sound of sound? I am the type of woman that feels a strong connection to her body, the penalties and the perfection. In the end, to know oneself isn't any kind of freedom. If I unspooled you, Earth, I would see that it's lava's behavior that burns your surface to its form. That was Nora Treat Baby. Uh, so I will read now from my chat book, um, which is from a now defunct trans-focused press. Um, chat books definitely have a limited run a lot of the time. This one is no exception. Um, I actually feel really distant from these poems. They're kind of uh, from another time in my life. So I really loved what Erica was saying about the cyanotype as an image specific to the weather conditions it was produced under. And so I'm really enjoying that as a way of thinking about this work specific to the weather conditions it was produced under. Um, so I'm gonna start with one poem that is about sending a text to someone from an Android to an iPhone and how the emojis do not look the same and that can cause a lot of problems. I was never sure. Cloud, 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 cloud. Passion flower or some kind of flower. I should ask my mother. Heart that reverberates, a face blushing with soft eyes. Perky plum, sweep of the polished brush up the nails. Crystal ball, cloud, cloud, 
bow, cake with strawberries. The high priestess wearing orchids. On her iPhone, it looks like a bride. How embarrassing, I had meant pink rain princess. The vortex or portal, I was never sure. Wave, 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 wave. The love hotel, a cloud, a cloud. Pink poodle, chick, new from the egg. Sun that sets into the water without changing the sky. Uh, this is a poem about deciding to go on hormones after a long time. Which one is the bridge? The landscape, winter reeds that hold their shape. Some half remembered fact about the ocean floor, how it's young, constantly turning itself over. A fact about albatrosses, how they don't senesce and will go on possibly forever as they are until they run up against sickness or injury. Abigail brings a tincture for my bad skin. Burdock, dandelion, golden seal, what am I so afraid of? I think the same thoughts are currently for years and do nothing about them. Just list what's wrong with what I am, then what would be wrong with what I might become? In speech therapy, I blow bubbles into a cup. By the end of each session, my voice has deepened into a dark well, lined with moss, full of cloudless water. It doesn't last. In regular therapy, I talk around myself and uncover nothing. I guess I will become hairier. I guess I will wait more. Abigail and I prance on the ellipticals. She wears floral print and jewelry to the gym and we are already the weirdest, hairiest, not man people here. Growing up, I thought the Brooklyn Bridge was whichever of the two you were taking towards Brooklyn. Sometimes Julieta lays her hand flat on my chest and I can't hide anything and it overwhelms me. Which one is the bridge towards me? Any or all of them? It is fine enough being like I am, of course, nothing will be perfect, but where to be satisfied? Like how I love lint brushing myself in public. I can be neatened absolutely anywhere in a small victory of order. But my cat has a perfect white fluffy belly and almost all of my clothes are black, so order is impossible. The winter light doesn't warm, just harshens, stark, ungentle. I guess I wish the world around me were just really, really different than it is. This morning, your horses. This morning, your horses walked beneath my window woke me with their warm, short gusts, breathing, come with us. What I called love was letting the loose dirt of someone else crumble over me. Then you called me out the window. It's not something I dig into alone anymore. Let's dance in the mirror and 90s montage our outfit changes, spinning to Mazzy Star in your red velvet pleather mesh. Let's get our lace wet, come. Braid my hair, get me ready, brush gold into my eyebrows until they glitter with malice. Sharpen your wings before we put our bodies out into the streets. Baby blue wax accretes on the wood of my desk, gathering itself in invisible increments. Wanting to meet you all the time is a sweet allowance of myself. Without knowing it, I'd sensed that need was dangerous. Now I can see it building. You say what I am, and I have a chance to become it. I want to read one more poem. Um, it's from a zine I made with my friend Shana Yang, um, who did beautiful illustrations. Uh, this is a really fun kind of zine to make because you can make it from one sheet of paper. You fold it, and it becomes eight pages, or eight, there are eight panels. Um, so it's very, very fun, very uh, scrappy to use. <laughs> can make those words. Um, and uh, it's about queer collectivities of the dance floor. So it's called Queer Heaven is a Dance Floor, but I can't relax. Our mouths are many to manage, make scarce spaces, kiss so brief. Coming from in and looking out, we alternate selves across songs. Dance makes time plastic, reach all nights in one and home at dawn, smell salt, Dust, poppers, kissing friends I want to see. Untouch across the room, but hear all disco years at once. 
thighs between our thighs come with us. Thank you. So exciting, yes. Ah. Excellent, this is going so well. Uh, I can't wait to see what the, uh, the next reader has in store for us. Uh, Jordan Castle uh, is the author of the chapbook, All His Breakable Things. Uh, her work has appeared or is forthcoming in Hobart, HuffPo, uh, New Ohio Review, The New Yorker, and elsewhere. Uh, she is a contributor to the food and culture magazine, Compound Butter, and an editor at large for Pigeon Pages, a literary journal and New York City-based reading series. She has an MFA in poetry from Hunter College and currently lives in Philadelphia. Please welcome Jordan Castle. Thank you so much. Um, I love you, John, so much as a person in my life and an That's artist. Cool. Um, and thank you, Kamiko. Thank you for everybody who makes this possible. And I, I keep saying this with virtual events, the only thing that I love about the pandemic at all is that it brings people in different areas together for these virtual events we couldn't otherwise do. Um, so that means a lot to me. This little chapbook, actually, John was the host of my chapbook launch over a year ago. So I'm kind of I'm not removed from these poems, but it's interesting. These poems have seeded a much bigger book um, that has been an interesting journey. So, but thank you all so much, especially family who has tuned in for this um, and family who had to go and will catch the recording, like my sister, Leslie, I love you. Um, so yeah, let's start with a poem. This one is called Summer Solstice. The doorbell rang or did they knock? Then a cavalcade of shoes and eyes and teeth on the stairs, their badges, everything glinting. The heavy footfalls shook my wooden Barbie mansion and toppled Power Rangers in line at the McDonald's drive through as they snaked right to his basement office. Only roots and stems visible in our flower boxes above. Not this again. Can't I pick a different lock? Summer solstice brings out the horror movie in me, the capture the flag in me, a junior high cartwheel in me, a series of things followed by a series of things. I keep my mind razor sharp in case of intruder and some mornings I stick a fork in a memory and it comes out clean. Um, this next one for my fellow Jews in the audience and Jew enthusiasts, um, this is called Tzitzi. On the bottom shelf of the dark bookcase inside a velvet bag. My father's tallit, white with blue, still perfect after years free from dust, mailed to me the winter my grandmother died. It's careful embroidery I cannot read, turn each letter over in my mind, feel for its shape. An alphabet lost when I was young, I never became a bat mitzvah. Her porcelain geese, or are they swans? line my shelves. I keep her heavy blue-green bowl on the floor in empty urn. I don't know where it lived when it was hers, how to imagine or reconcile the shape of her face in those last years, my yellowed school photos on her fridge. That year they sent a photo album. I am five, six, never older than 11, and she is eternally grandmother aged. Enormous eyeglasses, Fat pearl baubles hang from her ears and neck. I touch them without care, as if they belong only to me. Her locket knocks against my chest. Now I wear her ring. I kiss the Talit's fringe without its blessing. Um, and this next one, this is, I think I wrote this when I lived on the Upper West Side, and now I'm so far in Philly. I love Philly. Um, but this is called Passing Through East Harlem. So other side. Passing through East Harlem, cab window cracked. There's a little dog sniffing the sidewalk for crumbs, collarless. Ribs show through its blonde fur, tufts of it, maybe six months old. You ask aloud what you should do when what you want to do is jerk the handle and go, but the person beside you in the back seat warns against it, says you don't have gloves, you have to keep going. Sure, there's a number you can call, though he doesn't know it. You dial 311 instead of 911. Correct, the operator says, as does the next and the next. 
until you reach a dispatcher who notes the intersection, the dog's slight build, its color, a shock of yellow superimposed on a beige city block. But she can't say whether a driver will reach the dog, corral it, how it works if ever it does, if they use a net or treats or a whistle, whether the shelter is kill or no kill. She only thanks you and hangs up, surrendering you to Saturday. Um, and this one, so I am, I'm 30 years old. And if you are my peer, you might have also loved Tamagotchis. Um, so here's a little Tamagotchi poem for everybody. It's called Handheld. There's another version of this story where I drain the past, rouge my cheeks with its blood, make a dead thing live. But in this one, I stole things. Some wants are wanton. You only know it once it's in your pocket. That's why I did what I did that day after recess ended and I stayed put. Dug up a Tamagotchi in the sand below the monkey bars. Pixelated pet lost beside the black top. Covered it with my hand, slid it into my pocket. Later, pushed its buttons, tried to revive it. I couldn't. And that afternoon I sat in my closet until the sun went down. Listened for the silver bell of your voice pushed back plastic hangers, weighed down with sweaters, and climbed out. And that one is for my mom, who is here, which is great. Um, this next one is for and about my husband before he was my husband. Um, I love this one because I grew up with Poland Spring bottled water. That's like the holy grail of bottled water. You guys know, some of you know. Um, so anyway, this is when we were in New Orleans and they have Ice Canyon. Uh, so we're going to talk about Ice Canyon, the water. This is called Visitor to Ice Canyon. The cheaper brand of water bottle, label cartoonish on the nightstand. Ice Canyon, the only unreal place from which I've ever drunk. Poland Spring has nothing on Ice Canyon, which tastes like a fairy tale brook cut with hand soap. And which you bought for us at the all night CVS, where some man, you said, dripped blood down the aisles and the checkout line. That's a lot of blood, is all I thought in the moment, watching you uncap the bottle with your perfect clean hands. Um, so I'm just gonna read one more actually. And this um, this is the biggest seed I think for my, my big book. Um, and this is, you know, I think all poetry is personal and political. Uh, this is a really important time, especially me as a white person speaking to other white people that I hope we all know that it's our job to move things forward and to make a difference, have weird conversations, uncomfortable conversations about helping people who don't look like us and don't move through the world like us. Um, so there's a little bit, there's a lot more in my chat book about incarceration. This one is the, the closest to it uh, that I'm gonna read now. Uh, this is called Disappearing Act. The day God went missing again, we made cake from cornmeal and sea salt, yellow grit sticking to our palms like a psalm felt instead of red. I can't overhear another statistic about the prison system because all I see is my father in his cell, khaki drab and tunnel vision. I wanted him here in our home state, a dark North star guiding me home in the black web of trains I ride underground in a city he can't stand. It's too loud, too cold, too full of people who don't pay attention, refused him the fame he sought. Once he asked why I left San Francisco, clear ocean, 90 degree hills, better burritos. I couldn't tell him there were nephews, how I missed the jangle of my mother's bracelets, the feeling I get now when the plane lands and I am back in New York, where they don't see me if I don't wanna be seen. Because home is an abstraction, like sheet music without a sheet. And my calculator doesn't do long division, but I know it's been years since we plucked guitar strings at his house with its wind chimes, its sliding back door, all his breakable things. Thank you so much. And thank you, John, in particular. Oh, thank you, Jordan. Oh. Mm. All right, we are closing up a, a really fantastic reading. Uh, with with uh with uh, someone from my alma mater, Queens College. Uh, let's see here. Uh, Leila Ortiz, 
uh, is a poet and social worker born and raised in New York City. Uh, her work has appeared in numerous publications, including uh, An Anomaly, A-N-M-L-Y, uh, Apogee, Bodega, Sixth Vinch, and Tinderbox. Her poem, Night Surrender, was featured on The Slowdown with Tracy K. Smith. Layla is the author of two chapbooks, Girl Life, Recreation League, 2016, and A Mouth Is Not a Place, Dancing Girl Press, 2017. She is a graduate of the Queens College MFA program, woo, and lettered in, in creative writing and literary translation. Uh, please welcome Layla. Thank you, John. I'm so happy to be here. This was such a beautiful event. Um, the panelists who spoke about the art of chapbook, that was amazing. Thank you for that. Um, and thanks, John and Kamiko. Um, I am a graduate of Queens College MFA, so I'm going to read from the chapbook that I started when I was a student there. And uh, it's called Girl Life. Let me show you that cover. I have a bunch of markings in it, but um, um, it was published by Recreation League, um, Matt L. Rohr, and he wanted to do the, the title like graffiti letter because um, it's basically a book about a lot of adolescents growing up in Brooklyn in the 90s and their experiences, but told through, um, I guess, more through the perspective of uh, a young girl. So I'm gonna read from that book only. Night Surrender. All of us on a stoop, late, too late to be out. We like to squat in black and blue night. We are owls with pocket knives. Stoop summer of uncertainty. Colt 45 tastes like rain and bone. This girl, Micah, left alone by parents off vacationing. The beastie boys whine, the girlie was deaf and she wanted to go, but we stay till night expires, taking dares and setting them on fire. This couple walks by, probably coming from a party. They laugh at something not funny. We must look like kids because the man smiles and asks if we smell pancakes, making our anger pop. Jonah follows them up the block. All I hear is the woman saying, stop, stop. Sorry, I should have issued a content warning. So a lot of these poems will have some elements of violence. Sob the beautiful. Lester keeps eyeballing us. We can't help the way we walk. We're high on ice cream sandwiches, banging against lunch tables, slipping on linoleum floor. Lester screams at us through the megaphone. We are animals in the cage of the cafeteria. Juan flips a table over. His nickname is Saab. It's what he writes on the walls. Lester seems surprised at Saab's strength. The tables are heavy with long benches screwed into the sides. Lester pauses before he chases Saab out of the cafeteria and into the hallway. Saab doesn't give a shit. He's the kind of kid most people are afraid of with long black hair and combat boots. He's 16 and still in the ninth grade. Whenever I see him, I chirp, hi Juan. He smiles through rotten teeth. That's why I'm heartbroken. He's running for his life down the hall. That years from now, he'll die with a frothing mouth. Girl life. This time I'll make my smile real. Forget the stories in my head. Forget I bled at 13 after my first time. Forget Aria took him from me. Forget he wasn't worth it. His name was Joe and he'd had a crack at us all. Once he threw Vera out while she was still naked, she pounded on his door to let her in. If I could remember Vera naked, locked outside and pleading to get in while Joe's father knew but did nothing, too busy doing coke, I'd be different. I wanted Joe to love me best. 
He was part Puerto Rican, just like me, not to mention I was a whole half filled. He said I reminded him of his mother. She'd left him alone with that fucked up dad. All the girls talk shit about Vera, whose hair was our envy, blonde falling sideways across her face. We made up a rap about her, rhyming blow and ho. She could handle it. I only ever saw her cry once, and when I saw her head in her hands, I tried hard not to care. L and E forever. As I lay on his bedroom floor, he kicked me in the rib cage like he'd seen his father do to his mom. She once sent me to the store for a pack of Paul Malls, unfiltered. I remember being small at the counter, looking at the squat red box with white lettering as the man handed them to me. The boy was sharp boned, his body slight beneath his clothes. I tried to fight before the wind knocked out of me. His mom made the best egg salad, pale yellow and soft from too much mayonnaise, slathered onto white bread and cut down the middle. She listened to Johnny Mathis and smoked in the unlit living room. I'd walk the narrow hall to say hello as gray light through the window exposed half her face. She'd smile, hi honey, how are you? and keep smoking. On the day he kicked me, I was so quiet. Maybe she didn't hear. Okay, I'm gonna read uh, my last poem. Uh, it's called Forever Lonely. It's been too long since the sky was a dance floor. Who knew growing up meant nothing's ever the same jelly sandals with mini on the buckle. How the smell of wet woods or a barbecue in a city park can make me small again. Later, I wore a nameplate, forever lonely, thick gold around my neck. My boyfriend's jeans pegged at the ankle, baby powder, his smell. A voice came through a screen as we watched videos after school, his old sofa, his carpeted floor, the velvet fear of sex. Thanks. Wow. Uh, holy crap. Thank you so much for that bold and vivid uh, reading, Leila. Ah, uh, I want to thank all of my fantastic readers today. Uh, Dudrick, uh, Charles, Jordan, and Leila, you were all wonderful. Uh, I'm just going to praise you from afar uh, and kick this back over to Kaneko Han, uh, who has some final words for you. Yes, uh, let me add my thanks. The um, amazing, amazing group and each so wonderfully different. Um, thank you. Um, you do CUNY proud. Can I just say that? <laughs> thank you. Uh, and thank you everyone for joining us. Please come back on April 15th, four o'clock for a presentation and readings. Uh, we're gonna have uh, Peter Vanderberg on how to start a chapbook press. Uh, and uh, they all, uh, Ghostbird Press, his press has an award. So two of the uh, awardees will be reading. And then to cap off, all three of the chapbook events, we're going to have Alicia Ostriker, who is poet, critic, activist, and a much loved New York State Poet Laureate. She will read from her hybrid chapbook, which she composed just for our chapbook festival. And it was published by Ghostbird Press. So please join us. It's gonna be a uh, fantastic, third and final event. Meantime, please take good care. <laughs>